Recently I decided that I wanted to make a thumbnail tutorial. If you look at my most recent Oblivion series on the channel, you will see that each thumbnail is customized, I have a ton of fun making them, and I think they do a pretty decent job at grabbing the viewer's attention. So I wanted to teach you guys how to produce something similar, basically just kind of going over different Photoshop tips and tricks, and how to produce at least like the bare minimum gaming thumbnail. Obviously you guys will probably do something different, but this is how I go through my process. So I'll start out by creating the title. And this is actually a pretty important part because the title of the video is what you also want to convey with your thumbnail. So I'm gonna go with something like this. Can we save Varanis from the trolls? Is it the best title? I don't know. A lot of people will do something like this. So let's go ahead and finally open Photoshop up. So this step is kind of weird. This is just personally what I do. Instead of starting a new file, I actually go to thumbnails and I open my very first thumbnail. So what I'm about to do is kind of stupid. I'm going to show you guys a better alternative. I just never got around to doing it this way yet for some reason. So I'm going to go ahead and delete every asset that I don't need, which is typically um, everything but this. So I keep my logo in the corner, the game's logo in this corner, and then obviously the number of the episode. And we're just gonna go ahead and change that right now. I use Photoshop's guiding lines, all these pink lines appearing, that's so helpful for centering text and centering things within the middle of the frame. It really helps you line things up. So instead of doing what I just did, it would be really smart if I saved this right here and just called it like Oblivion Thumbnail Template. That way I could just always go to this file without having to delete all the other assets. I don't know why I haven't done that, but that's that's what I would do personally. I'm, in fact, I'm just going to do that right now. So I'm going to go ahead and do save as. And instead of having it be episode one, I will do thumbnail template and save that. That way we will start out with this for every single thumbnail. And obviously you can have whatever you want on your template. You don't need this logo, the game logo, perhaps you want it to change every time, you want it to be in a different corner, you want to rotate it in different episodes, enlarge it. I mean, you could do whatever you want. I like to have a consistent thumbnail because I do like the playthrough kind of format for my videos. I think a lot of people actually recommend that you do not have numbers in your thumbnail or uh, numbers in your title for that matter as well. Apparently the algorithm doesn't like that, but that's just what I've been doing on my channel. So actually to start off with, I'm just going to go through some basic tips. Um, right away, the first thing that comes to mind, that's something I learned kind of recently that's extremely helpful. So let's say you erase something uh, a few too many times and then also, I don't know, you delete a 7 on accident and you start hitting Control Z but you hit it too many times. I wanted some of those erase lines right through the middle of his face, I guess. If you hit control shift Z, you actually undo in the opposite direction. So that's something worth noting. So of course we're still on our template. So what we're gonna wanna do as soon as possible is actually go straight to save as and actually call it episode 77. Do that right at the start because if you work on the entire thing and you're done and you hit control save, then the Oblivion thumbnail template will actually be saved over with all the work that you just did. Because something I have done before is when working with episode one thumbnail, I accidentally saved it over with like episode 50 and I just lose the episode one thumbnail forever. If I ever needed to get that back for some reason, it will now forever be that episode 50. So in other words, just be careful when you're saving, always do save as and don't save over a template of any kind. So now let me quickly check what was the name of this episode. Can we save Varanis from the Savage Trolls? Um, first of all, I don't think we actually need my character in this. In this one, a lot of my thumbnails do include my character. But most of the time, if a thumbnail is focused on a different character, I'd rather have them be the center of attention instead. So what we're actually going to do is go to Google and find some assets for our thumbnail. So we're going to want to find Varanis. Obviously type the name of the game, that's the easiest way. Go to images. So here he is, this is like the clearest picture. You're going to want to look in the corner here for something that's pretty HD because we're actually working on a 1980-1080 canvas here that is HD. And this is what YouTube mostly accepts. You can also do 1280, 720. You're gonna wanna find something that's pretty big, um, typically over like 500 by 500. Otherwise, if you stretch it up to scale, 
it can get really grainy. Like this, for example, 200, 200. If I were to try to stretch this up to size within this canvas, it would get really distorted and it wouldn't work very well. Now, depending on what game you're playing, it could be really difficult or really easy to find some assets. Personally, for Oblivion, I found it really hard. For example, like this is the only photo of Varanus I can find. However, if I were to go to Skyrim Dragon Transparent, you would get so many cutout images of dragons already. So we'll go ahead and pick this one. I'm going to save it to my folder that I've dedicated. That's another huge thing is organization. Personally, I have like a pictures folder and then for Epic Biscuit, I separate a folder for each type of video that I do or each series, I should say. So we go to Oblivion and then I separate that even further into thumbnails and pictures. Pictures could be organized a bit better, perhaps by episode would be really helpful, but I kind of like to see everything laid out in case I need it for a future thumbnail. And then we're going to need a savage troll or AKA just a troll and see here we have a cutout image of a troll. Now here's something really important to keep in mind. What you don't want to do is steal someone's image without their consent. You want to try to find images that were literally made to be used by people. Don't use someone's personal artwork like this, for example, <laughs> don't, don't use this. I don't know why you would use this. Clearly someone like hand drew this. You wouldn't want to put that in your thumbnail because if that artist were to see it, chances are they'd have a pretty good chance at getting your thumbnail or video taken down because technically that's their image you're using without their permission. I usually pick things from websites that actually offer up PNGs for download, such as Fave PNG. If you go here, this person has put this image up for people to download. So therefore, I think you're pretty safe using it. I also think the safest types of images are ones from the wiki. For example, like Elder Scrolls Fandom, since it's on such like a public page. Now again, I don't think this makes it right. I don't think this completely saves you from like copyright claims. But this is just like the safest option and what I've been doing. So I'm going to use this image. And if it is a PNG with this like transparent background, chances are if you were to save that and open it up in your template, it actually still keeps those boxes around it, which can be kind of annoying. Usually I just take the magic wand tool and remove that. It's pretty easy, but sometimes it can be more difficult than that, especially when it's an effect. If I tried to use the magic wand tool, it keeps all that like white background in there and it just ends up looking horrible like you'll never get it looking quite right so you may be thinking like what the hell i thought this was a png it should be transparent but actually what you need to do rather than just saving it from here you have to go to the website itself and download it from their site so it actually turns out that this site is probably going to make you pay for these images do not pay for pictures like if you're a business, yes, that's like the safest route to go. That way you are completely free of copyright. You are paying to use that image. If you're not finding the image you want, you could do HD if you're finding too many low res images. Or what I like pretty much always do is type in transparent. Now, usually this will cut out the background and that just saves you the work of having to manually go and cut out an image, which I will show you guys how to do in a second here. But you can already see like over here, look, a perfect cutout of a frost troll from Skyrim. I think it's just the age of oblivion. Like this is the same image we already looked at and it's clearly the only image we're going to find. But this actually isn't too big of a problem because like I already showed, we can easily magic wand out the border and we now have our troll. And remember, we already have our picture of Varanus. So open him up, but he has a background. This is one of the things that I think takes a lot of practice cutting out images from their background because it can either look really bad or really good. So I like to zoom in a little bit. Actually, not that much because you want to get the whole picture in frame. That's the easiest way. And what I've started doing recently, you can use the lasso tool and literally like manually circle everything. You have to hold down your mouse the whole time and see I cut off a bit of his ear there. Like, if you're really precise, this is how I used to do it. Um, but yeah, it usually leads to some errors, so I don't do it like that anymore. Instead of the lasso tool, I go with the magnetic lasso tool. And what this does is you click once, and you just start dragging your cursor along the edge of what you're trying to cut out. It's pretty good. It uses the color differentiation between the background and the subject to actually find where exactly you need to be cutting. 
Now, it's not flawless. If I, like, went way over here, obviously, it's going to start following me. But for the most part, it's, like, really good. If you're following the line, if you have a kind of steady hand, chances are you'll be okay. And I'll show you in a second what to do if you do make errors. It's fine if you cut off little pieces here and there because there is a way to fix that. So let me go ahead and cut out this whole image. Okay, that might have been one of the worst cutout jobs I've ever done in my life, but I'll show you how to kind of fix that. I'm just going to have to do a little bit more work here. So now you can actually go to the manual lasso tool while it's still highlighted. And there's a super useful way to use this tool. If you hold down shift, you'll see a little plus sign up here next to the lasso. So with that little plus sign next to it, if you were to circle any other part of the image, it adds to what you've already selected. So now this is part of our selection, which obviously we don't want. So now if you pull down Alt, you'll see a little minus sign up here, and that actually subtracts selections from your image. So if I zoom in now, now you can get a little bit closer. Any part that I don't want, you hold down Alt, you trace, and you circle, and that removes that selection. So you can literally get pretty fast at this um, once you know what you're doing. Once you're, you're used to like tracing those lines, you don't even have to really circle parts of the image. You just draw a straight line and it's usually pretty good at adding it. Sometimes you do have to like recircle it a few times. But this is the best way to get like a perfect cutout of what you want. And it still doesn't have to be perfect if it's something that's a little bit smaller. Since this is the subject of our thumbnail though, I do want it to be cut out kind of well. So again, let me take the time here to kind of go through and just fix this image up a little bit because I did a horrible job at this. All right, so I think that's pretty good. If I zoom out here, um, you could actually always hit fit on screen. That's another tip. Basically the view system, all I really do with this is use the zoom in. I know there's shortcuts. If you hit like shift, I don't even know what the shortcut is. I'm really bad with like hotkeys and all those shortcuts. I don't memorize a lot of them. So I usually end up doing it manually through the menus which works as well, it's just a little bit slower. So now if you go over to your move tool and you grab your selection, it'll completely cut it out from the image. And you can kind of quickly check to see if there are any like pieces of his body that are missing that you need to redo. So now grab this and you're gonna wanna drag him all the way up until you're hovering over this and that will actually insert it into this tab. So that's how you take assets from over here and drag them into your main template. So this bar up here will show all your open files. If I were to open this picture of a baby, <laughs> you would drag it from over here and drag it into your main template here. And then obviously once you're done, what I like to do is just X out of that. I don't save any of mine. If you wanna keep this cut out, I would hit save there and then he'll always be cut out for future use. So you might notice if I were to try to drag this baby into our thumbnail over here, it says this, it's currently a background layer. You cannot move a background layer. So you can either hit convert to normal layer, but just for future reference, basically what this is saying is if you look down here at your layers tab, there's a little lock here and it says background. So in order to make it not a background layer, you just click this little lock here and then it becomes a normal layer. You can move it around and you can see that it no longer acts as a background. The background is now completely transparent. That's what these white and gray squares mean back here. And this is actually really important um, for a new thumbnail. If you were to hit new, notice it's white. That means that if you were to put an image on this and you're expecting this to like end up transparent because you don't see any background, well, this whole image is white right now. You want it to be transparent. So again, you can see that this background is locked. You unclick that and now it just becomes a giant white square. And you could just straight up go over here, press delete and now it's transparent. And now you can actually see like this whole time this baby has not been cut out. It has its own white background. So anyways, enough of this baby. We don't, we're not using him for our current thumbnail. 
We can already see I have my troll, I have Varanis. I think that's a pretty good starting point. Now I want to really start framing everything. Another really quick tip that I want to go over that's like pretty basic, but a lot of people don't really understand, I feel like. I see a lot of thumbnails where things are overlapping where they shouldn't be. So see how he's overlapping the Oblivion logo and he's behind the 77. That means that this layer is in between them and we can actually see that if we go over here, the 77 layer is above him and the logo is behind him or under him. If you hold and click on that layer and drag it above, he is now behind it. So you always have to make sure that things are in front when they're supposed to be or behind when they're supposed to be. It really helps add depth to your thumbnail when he's behind the 77 and in front of Oblivion. It looks like there's literally three different layers here. There's the background, the foreground, and the midground here where our subject is present. So you can always play with that. So if you hit Control T, whatever layer you're on, it will form a box around it. Now this is the transform box. You can literally stretch it out. I think most of us know how to do this, um, but what we want to do is hold down shift and pull from the corner that sizes everything uh, in a uniform way. That way it doesn't stretch out. And you can kind of see like he's already getting a little pixely. If we go too big, too far out of its native resolution, it gets pretty muddled. It doesn't look the greatest. So we're going to have to scale him down a little bit just to kind of hide that. Now remember like your thumbnail isn't ever seen. Not ever, but rarely is it seen at this size. It's usually, you know, thumbnail size. So don't worry too much if things seem a little bit blurry. Chances are no one's gonna notice it. I actually think this size is good, and then I want this troll. I like his position right now. I like him kind of up in the corner. If you control T and then you go a little bit past the corners, you can actually rotate this way. And if you right click, and go to flip horizontal and flip vertical. These are really helpful tools that'll literally rotate his whole body um, automatically on the Y axis. So that can be really useful, especially if you want more than one troll, which is what I'm about to do here. So let's say I want another one. I would go over here to my layers tab, right click the troll and hit duplicate. Now this forms an exact copy of that layer right on top of this one. So now if I were to have my move tool out, you can see there's now two of them. And again, control T, flip horizontal, and now he is looking the other way. They're all looking at poor Varanis here, about to tear him to shreds. I actually really like where this is going already. I think this is, this is looking pretty good. And again, remember, we want everything to be behind the 77. The viewer needs to see the episode number. I want everything to be behind my Epic Biscuit logo. I don't want that to be hidden at all. The only logo that I actually cover up sometimes is the Oblivion logo. So if you think that whatever's in frame is more important than this, or even honestly more important than your own logo, you can cover it up. It's all up to you in the end. But for this one, I think I'd like to have it behind. So something I should have done from the very start is actually put in a background. That way you can actually see if your cutout job is really good or really bad. So for my backgrounds, what I always like to do is whatever area this took place in. For example, this episode took place in Swampy Cave. It is a cave full of these swamp trolls in it. So I'm gonna go to the internet and do Oblivion Swampy Cave. And we're gonna find a lot of Wikipedia images, most likely. Actually, nothing too specific here. I don't want it to be outside. I actually wanna be in the cave. This image would be perfect, but it's really small. For the background, you really want it to be like HD because it's literally the full size of your canvas. So this image is really HD, it looks really good. The only problem I would have is this is from Nexus Mods. This is someone's mod, personal work. That's why it looks so good. I would be a little hesitant to use this. I know this is just the image itself, but I still feel like if that mod creator were to see that in the background, I don't know. I feel like not all creators would be okay with that. I'm actually about to show you another way that you can get your own personal images. That way there's zero guilt from looking online for anything, but it's a little bit harder. So if you pull up your editing software, I use Premiere Pro. I'm pretty sure any basic editing software will have this feature though. So I'll just find something similar or whatever works for you. But underneath the source video here, we can actually see a little camera that called export frame. So now if I sift through my own video, trying to find the inside of a cave, like this, for example, I'd say this is a pretty good frame, I guess. 
It's okay that all this stuff is here. I'll show you how to remove all that. So if you go ahead and click export frame, you can choose which folder you want it to go to. You can even name it and just hit OK. So now if you go back over to Photoshop and go into whatever folder you just saved that to, you'll be able to find it and pull it up. And it's an HD image. Pull it in and there we go. We now have our background. This is also incredibly useful for getting close-ups of characters' heads. Like this, for example, if I wanted a headshot of Madrin right here where there's no text obscuring his face or anything, I would just go ahead and hit export frame and then you can manually cut that out. And then you have your own HD image that is completely yours. What a lot of people will do, if you want a picture of your character's personal face, you can go ahead and turn the camera around, look at them, get a nice clear HD shot with the intent of exporting that frame later in your editing software. So there's only one problem with this image, actually two problems. One is this crosshair right in the middle and two is all the UI down here. So we hit control T and then just stretch it out. You can actually remove the UI pretty easily. It stretches out the image a little bit, but again, it is the background. I don't think it's that noticeable. If you're not comfortable with that, another thing you can do is while you're in the game taking this photo or lining yourself up for this photo to be exported later, you can usually turn the overlay off, the HUD, and then it'll just be a nice clear image. But if you're doing it in post like I am, I usually just stretch it just to kind of remove that. Um, the only thing I can't stretch out is this little crosshair. So now I'm going to introduce you to a super helpful tool, the Spot Healing Brush. This tool automatically references the colors around it and uses that to patch out um, anything that you don't want. So look at that, it's literally completely gone. This is our patched up image. There is nothing in the way. I'm going to drag it over here. And it's obscuring our trolls because it is above them on the layer tab. So we're just going to go ahead and drag that all the way to the bottom. And see, now we can actually see all those little white spots that we didn't quite cut out correctly. It's not a huge deal, but if you really care, you can zoom in, you can use the magic wand. Really get all those areas out of there. It can be distracting, but remember, this is at full size. Plus, we're going to do some, like, some outer glow that'll probably obscure a lot of the white spots that are around the edge. Speaking of outer glow, I think we're ready for that step. You can actually already see the outer glow effect on my logo, and basically what it does is it helps it stand out. Because if I didn't have that, look at that. That looks freaking horrible. You can see all the little white spots that I didn't quite catch. With the outer glow on, it helps make it pop and stand out on its own, and it also can cover up all these little white spots that are left on your image from when you cut it out. Or if something has a really like rigid outline that doesn't quite look good, this can also help make it look a little bit smoother. By double clicking on a layer, you bring up this tab. This is a super important tab, the layer style. So if I go down to outer glow, obviously it automatically puts on whatever settings I have. This is like my, my default outer glow settings. The opacity is important. I usually lower it a tiny bit just so it's not like bright white. You can add a little bit of grain to it by sliding around the noise. I don't see why you would do that. I just turn that completely off. The spread I usually keep around half. And then the size like really makes it uh, less accurate, I would say. Like less of an outline and more just like a cloud. So again, you can mess with all these personally. You can like find your own settings, really fine tune it. Something else that I always choose is inner shadow. I'm going to keep saying that everything adds depth even though... I've never really called it that before. It just helps things look nice. It makes things look a little bit more 3D. This can take some real fine tuning. I find the inner shadow to always be kind of annoying. Um, start out at like zero size and you can see exactly where the outline falls. Um, if you mess with the distance and then if you rotate around this angle setting, that's like you have to imagine wherever this line is, that's kind of like where your source of light is coming from. Actually, it's where the, the shadow is coming from. The source of light is opposite of this. So for example, if you want the shadow coming right down on top of his head, you would set it at 90 degrees. That's right on top. And if you mess with the distance, you can see it's coming from above. So then you kind of have to think to yourself, there's two trolls here. They would probably be obscuring the light. Therefore, there would be a shadow on this side of him and on this side of him. So for the first shadow, we're going to go ahead and set it to 40 degrees. Why not make the distance a little less? And you can see the shadow is really rigid. Um, to mess with that, increase the size of it and it'll look way more natural, really blended in. And then if you want it to be much darker, 
uh, go ahead and set the opacity up. Now since he is in a mine, I want the shadows to be pretty dark, I would say. Kind of increase the choke, I think that looks pretty good. It's also worth noting that if you hit use global light, then every shadow on your thumbnail will be exactly the same. It'll come from the exact same angle. That way you don't have to manually go in and set the angle every time. But we want our shadows to be different for each of our characters here. Now if we go over to inner shadow and click this plus sign, we can add a second shadow. And I'm just going to try to get that to the opposite um, side of him. And since he's up here, I want the shadow to kind of be coming down a little bit more. Kind of like that. Um, I actually think these shadows are a bit too dark. I think that looks a little bit better. So I set that to 59. Let's set this one to 59 as well. Yeah, I'd say that looks pretty good. So now the shadows kind of combine into one. You can add as many as you want, I believe. I think the shadows and the outer glow is like the most important uh, layer styles that you can use. I use them for pretty much every single asset within my thumbnails. A beginner mistake that a lot of people do, rather than using outer glow, a lot of people will use stroke. Now this just adds a very accurate outline of your image. And if you just set that to white, I mean technically this is the same thing, but look how bad it looks. It's so rigid because it's really trying to stay accurate to the outline, which honestly is never going to be perfect. Stroke is pretty much only used for text because text is so uniform and perfectly smooth, but that's why I choose to use outer glow over stroke for images. I just think it looks a lot better. Maybe if your lines are really clean, you could pick one or the other. Now we're going to go over to our trolls and actually a little shortcut that I'm going to do here. I'm going to combine them into one layer. I'm going to select both of my troll layers by clicking on this one and then holding down control and clicking on the other layer. Right click and then go to merge layers. Now what this will do and you can see down here, it combined them into one single layer. So now if I move one of them, they're both attached to each other. They move around with one another and the same effects will be applied to both of them now. So now by double clicking, hitting outer glow, you can see that the outer glow will be applied to both of them separately. And see this is an instance where you might have to adjust the outer glow a little bit because in his like little armpit area here, it looks pretty bad. One culprit of this that causes really bad outer glow is just little pixels that are off of his fur or outside of the boundaries of the image. So for example, if there's a literally a pixel, one pixel that's just outside, it adds outer glow to it, like quite a bit of it. So if there's a bunch of those compiled right along the side of the fur, you can see it makes it, it like raises it up, makes it really uneven. So that's like your number one culprit most of the time. So to fix that, because I think that's what's happening here. That's why it looks really bumpy. So I'm going to zoom in here. I'm just going to take my eraser tool. You can set it appropriately uh, to really get in those nooks and crannies. And then just kind of go around. You can see it's erasing some of that outer glow effect. Without actually touching the fur of the troll. Just sort of outline this inner area here. I'll just do the same thing over here really quickly. Kind of open up that space a little bit. So we have our outer glow applied. Of course, we're gonna apply our inner shadow. Now this is where things get a little bit tricky because now that they're sharing the same layer, the shadow will always be coming down to the right for both of them. Now that looks fine in this case. If you wanna have separate inner shadows for each layer though, I would recommend setting the inner shadow before you merge the layers. That way they can have their individual shadows. Because as it is, I don't think there's a way to set separate inner shadows for a single layer. Because as it is, like, I don't think you can take this shadow here, remove it while keeping this one. Because technically it's one layer. But luckily for me, again, I think that this would work on its own. I think these shadows look fine. I'm just gonna mess with the settings a little bit here. I think that looks perfect. So you can already see, like, this looks pretty good in my opinion. Um, the shadows really help make things pop, and obviously the outer glow. You want to use the outer glow for every separate subject in the frame. While we're on this subject, something else I want to add is that if you have too many layers, all with their own outer glow and their own shadows, it can start to look really bad and really cluttered. For example, in this older thumbnail I made, you can see that all of this is one layer. I actually ended up merging everything, so that way when I applied that outer glow and shadow, it would just maintain one continuous outline around all of them. Because imagine if each of these wine bottles had their own outer glow. It would look really bad, and they would all kind of morph into each other. 
So anytime you have like a really tight grouping of something, like these bottles, each of these three bottles is one group. Now for these two layers, they're completely separate. I want them to be distinct from one another. I want this guy to seem like he's in front. But let's just say I wanted to make them seem like they're right next to each other or they're on the same plane. Then what I would want to do is turn off their effects, turn off his effects, and actually take him and merge him together with the troll layer. So now all of this is one. Now if I go ahead and select outer glow, you can see that rather than having that outer glow right there, it actually combines it into one. So now it looks like they're right next to each other. So that's a little trick you can do. And again, if you apply the inner shadow, it'll apply to all three of them. Whether or not that's something you want, that's up to you. So I think this really came together. There's one last thing I want to do. This guy looks way too calm for a man about to be devoured by two trolls. So a insanely helpful tool that I recently learned literally while making my Oblivion series. Make sure you're selected on the correct layer. Go to filter and then liquify. Now this is a whole nother tab, a whole nother set of tools. We're gonna wanna zoom in on his face down in the left corner here. We can kind of zoom in. And we have a whole nother set of tools here. We got the forward warp, reconstruct, smooth, and bloat. I would say those are like the most helpful and then also like the freeze tools over here. So starting with forward warp, this is gonna be the one you're gonna most commonly use. You can see it's a giant circle here. And if you click and drag, you're literally pushing the image around. <laughs> So you can mess with the size, the pressure, the density. I usually only touch the size. And our goal here is to make them look scared. So you have to kind of think to yourself, what does looking scared look like? To me, that would be like raised eyebrows. Your eyes are kind of widened and like maybe a gasping expression. So like, or frowning too. So like that right there, you know, that looks pretty bad, but <laughs> you get the idea. You can literally warp the sides of the mouth, the nose, the forehead, and you can really convey emotion on your character's faces. If I drag the eyebrows up, now he looks extremely mad. Like, it's just that easy by warping those similar points on each image. A problem I ran into pretty quickly whenever I would try to make a scared thumbnail, I want the eyebrows to go up, but I don't want his eyes to widen like that. So this is where the freeze tools come in. If you freeze an area, that area will not be affected by any effect that you apply. So I literally want to freeze everything except his eyebrows. Now when I warp, when I push it up, his eye does not follow. You can literally push it as high as you want and his eyes will stay in that same position along with the rest of his face. It is completely unaffected. This is all affected. This down here is not. Now obviously that is like extreme, like no one's eyebrows go that high. So one way you could do this, it, like first of all, you can do control Z and just try again. But actually another method you can use is by pressing this reconstruct tool that will literally reset everything to the way it was. So if you went like way too extreme, like that, for example, if you just press reconstruct a little bit at a time, a little bit, a little bit, you can kind of get an in between. Now, if you decrease the size, you can really get like more specific with it. That's why playing with size is the most important part about this. Like you can really get specific with this tool. And if you just want to completely reset everything you've done, you can either hit cancel down here or you could just hold down the reconstruct tool on its entire face. You also want to make sure that your circle within the forward warp tool is uh, overlapping the entire eyebrow plus a little bit more. Because if you're it's if it's too small and you try dragging up, you can literally move like individual parts of the eyebrow like that. Uh, literally make it the letter M. But if you make it bigger, like what we want to do, you end up moving the entire eyebrow, which is exactly what we wanted because you're kind of moving the whole face around it as well. So I think that's an appropriate height for that. One other thing you might notice is it might look literally pixely from being stretched out. That's where the smooth tool kind of comes in. Uh, let me zoom in a little bit here. If you just kind of run this over the area, it smooths out a lot of those edges. It's a little bit like the reconstruct tool, but it can be far more subtle. It really like makes things less pixely and less warped looking. Uh, if you go to the thaw tool, you literally, it's an eraser for the freeze tool pretty much. And now we just want his eyes to be a little bit wider. So we're gonna go to the bloat tool, just kind of go around the eye and kind of just drag it left and right. The reason I do that rather than just holding it down is because it literally bulges the point that you're on, which is like in my case, or like, especially for an eyeball, 
you're usually selecting the pupil and you're making his pupil just look really big. It looks like he's high out of his mind. So if you don't want that like weird cat eye effect, that's why I go like back and forth. I just find that it kind of uniformly increases the size of everything. The reason this overall just doesn't look that great in my opinion is because it's such a low res image in the first place. There's not a lot of detail in the pupil. It all just kind of blends together. That's a common problem with these like smaller images. But again, if we zoom all the way out, like I think this really does convey what I tried to. I think his eyebrows need to go a little bit higher now though. Keep in mind, I myself, I'm still pretty new at using the liquify tool. I've only started using it for like uh, 40 or so Oblivion episodes. So I'm not a master at this by any means. I'm sure there's plenty of other tools that are helpful. For example, I have no clue what the hand tool does, the face tool. There's plenty of things I just straight up haven't used yet. All right, the last thing is the mouth. And what I do for the mouth, I want it to be like open. And obviously his lips are closed, so that's pretty much impossible to do. But what I have started doing is bloating the mouth. Make it like really wide. It doesn't matter how ugly it is, but we're gonna fix that. Go ahead and hit OK, and that'll convert all of our changes onto him. So now right on top of his mouth, I'm actually just gonna go to the paintbrush tool. Uh, make it kind of small and then I'm actually gonna go over to my color selector and choose like a really dark brown And then just sort of fill in like the middle of his mouth Obviously don't cover like all the lips entirely. There we go. I would say that looks all right And now I'll go up to pink. This is gonna be the tongue I think you could find a better color than I have but and then just include that in there um, however you want if he's screaming Then I would say it should probably more be more like that you really don't need a lot of detail for such small changes. Basically, all I'm trying to convey is that he's screaming. In fact, you probably don't even need the tongue. That probably makes it look worse. So this is probably all I would do. One more thing. I use these quite frequently, actually. Just drag these over. Control T. Make them pretty small and then rotate them. I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this sweat. Move it over here. Control T. Flip horizontal. There we go. It's like a pretty cartoony way to show that someone's scared. Now I want to keep his shadows in place, but I don't want the outer glow. So what I would do is just hide outer glow, but keep the shadows in place, then merge them all. And now reselect my outer glow. That way the shadows, I don't have to redo it all, but the sweat gets that outer glow effect without having shadow on it. Cause it would be weird for your sweat to have like a really obvious shadow effect on it. This is a pretty good thumbnail. I would personally use this, but just to show you guys a few more effects, one thing you could do is add text. If you go to the text tool and just start typing like, will he live? I don't know. <laughs> Obviously if it's, you highlight it, you can change the color of it. And like I was saying before, if you double click it, now would be the perfect time to use stroke. Uh, make the stroke black most commonly. Increase the size of it. You get really professional looking text. And another way to make it pop as well is to actually add inner shadow. You can kind of have it like just all around. That looks pretty good. Um, you can make it so that it's just on like one corner like this. That really makes it look 3D. And something you can use for all your layers as well. I don't really mess with it a lot of the time. If you go down to drop shadow, you can add like, you know, a drop shadow. <laughs> Literally what it's called. If you make the size zero and opacity a hundred, you literally get like a really clear backdrop that really makes it pop. I do this a lot for text mainly. And obviously like you can change the font and yeah, you'll have to like readjust the settings as you go. Now, just to get a tiny bit more advanced right at the end here, um, if you really want to. So I'm going to go ahead and try to make the trolls a little bit more animated. Cause let's say I don't want them in this basic position here. So let's say I want to move his arm around. So I have the troll layer selected. I grab my lasso tool and I just want to grab the area that I want to move around. So just highlight that. And now if I go up to layer new at the bottom here, there's two options layer via copy and layer via cut. If I did layer via cut, that literally slices the arm off pretty much. It slices my selection off and I now have this as its own separate layer. And what I can do with that actually is rotate it. And look, now it's like he's, he's scratching his shoulder. It's like he's about to backhand him in the face. One thing that helps before doing this, and I should have done this, is actually turn off all the effects. If it doesn't quite look right, 
one thing you can actually do, again, use that handy dandy spot healing brush tool, make it bigger, increase the hardness a little bit, and then with take your arm layer and take the troll layer. You wanna re-merge them. So now they're all one layer again, they all move as one. Take your tool and just run it along that seam and it'll literally blend the arm right into each other. So that it looks like one arm again, the, f the fur all perfectly blends. And now it just looks completely natural. If it's a little bit too square for you, you can go to the eraser and kind of like, you know, add that elbow like bend back into it. I'm gonna kind of rapid fire some tips off here. I'm just kind of working away at this now. Um, let's say you want a, a little bit of fur coming off because now it's too smooth for you. So on this spot healing brush tool, there's another helpful tool called the healing brush tool. Now this is actually different because you have to select the source yourself as it'll tell you if you try using it. So if you hold down alt, your cursor will transform into this type of icon. Now when you click on a piece of the fur and you drag, you can see you're literally getting exactly where you've selected. It's, it's drawing down the arm. Um, and you can even see like off to the left there, that's exactly where it's getting its source from. So now if you go to the eraser and just kind of lob off the really ugly looking parts. I don't know what my goal exactly of doing that was, but I literally like gave him a little bit of a bicep, I guess. And it looks completely natural with the rest of his fur. Um, and if I wanted to give it a little bit of like tufts coming off, you could literally get like a three point eraser and just go in and do this maybe. I don't know. I mean, personally, I wouldn't do that. Like you can kind of see up here. You can easily recreate that with the eraser tool if you had the time or wanted to see that looks a little bit better. So now also another method, if we recircle this arm that we want to move, we do layer and instead of doing via cut, we do via copy. Now this actually copies the layer. The arm is still there. Now we have another arm. Let's pretend like this arm is coming from off screen and we want it to go underneath this troll's arm. That's literally impossible with our current setup. Like if I drag this behind him, then it's all the way behind him. If I drag it in front, um, it's not behind this arm anymore. So then what we can do, and again, let me turn all the effects off here. That way it's a little easier to work with. Uh, see what we're doing kind of. Use the lasso tool again. Now you wanna select the part of the arm that you want to be in front of this arm. So for example, let me just grab this. Boom. So that's about the biggest portion of the arm that we're gonna need. Um, and now we're gonna go to layer, new, via copy, turn the effects off on that. Now that looks, the only reason it looks that bad is because it didn't copy over like this dude's effects. Again, that's why it's kinda easier if you turn all the effects off. See, now it looks completely natural. Because at the end, once you're done, we're going to merge all of it together, and then you can add your effects, and it'll all look natural again. So now we have layer 15, and this layer is this portion of the arm, right? So what we want to do, we drag our arm here. Again, remember, we want this arm to be under this guy's arm. Layer 14, which is our arm reaching off screen, we drag it behind 15, and you can now see it gives the illusion that it's coming from underneath the arm. Now, obviously, if you drag it over here, you can see a little bit better how this works. So in this one, uh, literally, like pretty close to this example, actually, uh, getting something underneath the arm, I had to get the, uh, the sword sheath uh, behind his arm. You can also see here, um, the manipulation of the arm. I actually, you know, it doesn't even really quite match the skin tone. That's pretty obvious to me now, but I literally, this is a totally separate image of a dude's arm doing this motion. I just lobbed his arm off and attached this one on and then I merged both layers and then used our uh, spot healing brush and then just kind of rubbed them together a little bit. And then you can also see that by merging all the layers together and then choosing the outer glow. That means that this part of the katana does not have an outer glow around it, but then up here it does. It just makes the whole image feel like it's as one. And then also here on the guard's face, you can see a pretty poorly done liquefy job to make him look a little more scared. 
but you can't even really see it in the final thumbnail so and actually going all the way back to fallout 4 these chains on the scale i had to get this one chain to go in front of oh man what's his name deacon wow i can't believe i forgot his name there uh while these chains back here are actually behind everyone same here with max and these two chains here had to go in front and there's that sweat teardrop that i use so much and again, while this is like a basic thumbnail, I still think like this is all you really need. I could have his arm, you know, like wrapped around his head. Maybe his uh, hand is resting on his other shoulder uh, just to kind of show like, oh, he's really going in for the kill. I could actually probably open up his mouth maybe um, by doing a little bit manipulation here. You know, you can kind of see like layer, new, cut, kind of opening it up. You see like that and then maybe find a, a monkey mouth online and put that in there i don't know there's all sorts of things you can do i'm just trying to open you guys up to all the different tools that you can use there's plenty of other things i didn't touch on yet uh, if you go to filter blur gaussian blur it literally blurs it this is super useful for trying to bring focus to the forefront rather than the background very recently actually i just did this i used color overlay to make this guy appear icy so you can actually see here if I turn these effects off, uh, pattern and color overlay. My color overlay setting for this is just a light blue at 35%. You can see if I crank it to 100%, you can um, affect how much it is. In fact, if you change this to black, this is a really good way to just get a silhouette of something. If you were doing like a, like a who is this kind of thing, or you could put a big question mark here like that, and then you could kind of be like, oh, who is this? It could be anyone, that kind of thing. It's really helpful. I do this a lot too for like anger. You can do a red overlay. If you want to match skin tones, you can do kind of a, a pinkish overlay and mess with the opacity there. Like in the last example where the dude's arm was mismatched from the rest of his body, I probably could have done this, uh, added a little bit more red, made it a little darker or a little bit of yellow. Now the reason I did pattern overlay is because I wanted to make it look like ice. And I think this worked really well. I'm really proud of this one. If you go to pattern overlay, it does the same thing as color overlay, except you have a few preset patterns. You have trees, grass, water, and obviously I went with water for the ice effect. But you could choose any of these and then change the opacity. But literally at low opacity and also at low scale, like a lot of these patterns, can really just add some texture to your image. Like for example, this dirt one, it just makes it look really gritty. So those are just some extra tools. I think I've pretty much gone over like most of the Photoshop tools that I use. I don't think there's too much more that I mess with. Inner glow is similar to inner shadow. You guys can probably figure that one out yourselves. I guess at the end here, I'm just going to quickly go through some of my recent thumbnails and see if there's any other effects. Here's one that was really fun to do. This was a, a pretty unique one. Basically what I did is by taking my character's face here, you can go into blending options and you can turn off channels of his body. Um, so this is only the blue color, this is blue and green, this is all three. So by taking only the red channel is active and then you duplicate this and now you take this layer and you make only the green channel active, for example, and by blending them together, um, you're actually getting different colors in there. And then you can see like, I would do a blue layer in front and then just kind of put them all together. So then you merge these together, you duplicate the layer, and with this top layer, you then start selecting thin strips, moving it off to the left, and you get your glitch effect. And then you just do that throughout to your heart's content. And that's how you do like a basic glitch effect. You can really fine tune that and uh, get it far better than I did. But here's one where I took the, you know, classic me and the boys meme and just cut out like the eyes, cut out the mouth and really uh, tried to fit these ghosts faces into it. This is using the layer new via copy or via cut. You just kind of cut things out and put them in. You can see I used a different uh, color outline for this armor to make it pop. I used a yellow one. That's sort of the color I use for something like a relic or a treasure. 
White I use for all the subjects, and red I use for something that's evil or dark. This one I was proud of. I used some color overlay on a basic hand. Uh, the lightning looks really awful, <laughs> but but just by adding like a blue outer glow, it doesn't look that bad. And then you can see I added some jitter or some uh, some grain effect to this outer glow to make it look like he's getting electrocuted. And then I literally just put a picture of a skull on top of my character's face and lowered the opacity to give it that electrocution effect. With the tools that hopefully I provided you guys with within this video, if you just start messing around, you can make some expert level thumbnails. And like, don't expect too much out of yourself. Literally, if you just had like this one troll here in the center, and maybe some text like, trolls? <laughs> I don't know. Pretty basic, but still, I would I would click on this if I, if I saw this. I would say this is pretty professional. Pretty standard stuff here. And then one last thing, when you are done, you have your finished product ready to go, first of all, make sure you save. And also remember what I said at the start, make sure you don't save over your template, always do save as. But then go down to export here. You can either quick export as PNG, this is fantastic for creating transparent background images, that way it ensures that the background stays transparent. If it's a JPEG, that checkerboard pattern will become part of the image, it will not become transparent. So just keep that in mind. The only problem with PNGs is the file size is pretty big and YouTube has a really small file size like maximum. It'll probably give you an error saying your file's too big if you do it this way. So what I've been doing is going to file export, export as, and then on this menu you can go to format and change it to whatever you want, PNG, JPEG. I do JPEG, um, it's a much smaller file size and I think you lose a little bit of quality but I'm not really too sure on that. All I know is that these files are small enough for YouTube to accept it. So I always export as a JPEG, name it what you want and then you should have your thumbnail. Now when you go back to YouTube, go to your video, you go to upload thumbnail here, click on that and then you gotta find 77 and there it goes it should upload pretty much immediately and you will see the final product here uh, Make sure everything is in frame. It's the right size. Everything looks pretty Pretty HD and good and then click save and you will have your thumbnail your professional gamer thumbnail <laughs> Up and ready to go Let me know in the comments if you guys have any tips for me if I said anything wrong If you have any better ways to do things because remember this is all just from personal experience I'm sure there's better ways to do a lot of these tricks. Also, if you have any questions or you would like another video on some more advanced techniques or some just other techniques, I don't think I fully covered everything, but I got a pretty decent chunk of my, uh, my tips and tricks documented here within this video. So just let me know in the comments and I will respond to all of them. Hope you guys found this useful and I will see you in the next Oblivion episode probably.